the Tie Cats Audio Network. This is the CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. This is the CFL This Week. I'm your host, Bubba O'Neill. Another exciting week has concluded in the league, and we look forward. Again, we bring in an all-star cast of characters to break down what we have seen, what we expect to see as we get a little closer to the playoffs. Some breaking news this morning out of the nation's capital. We'll get there, but let's introduce our panelists. Brody Lawson joining us, plus baby, always a pleasure. Pat Steinberg, also from CFO.ca, 960 uh, Sportsnet out in Calgary. And the man, as we say, I know he doesn't do it anymore, but he is the man with the details from CKRFM, the voice of the, I guess, God's country, we like to call it, the Rough Riders. Derek Taylor, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. That's fantastic. Okay, guys, let's talk about uh, what's happened early this morning. Uh, I don't know if you guys follow Marcel Desjardins on Twitter, but he released some kind of message saying, I am no longer a member of the Red Blacks. Uh, the Red Blacks losing last weekend to the Tiger Cats at Tim Hortons Field. I guess some would say in an embarrassing way, 32-3, uh, to three, I believe, was the score. The record drops to 2-9. and nine. Mr. Taylor, was this the inevitable? Oh, I've been waiting for this, honestly, since the beginning of the season. So that it drops now, I, I totally get it. I mean, you alienate a bunch of your superstar players before 2019. You go 3-15, and 15, and then you followed up with 2-9. and nine. This absolutely had to happen. He, his job is to put together a team with talent. They had very little talent when the season started. Not much has changed. And, yeah, honestly, this is just the... The other shoe dropping. I've, I've been waiting, and here we are a couple of days before the trade deadline. Pat, I was going to say this, I, and, and yes, I think everything that Derek says there really is correct in the sense, but was there not going to be kind of a free pass in 2021 because of the shortened season? Well, see what, for me, I go back to, like DT was saying, I go back to 2019 where he – Marcel let a lot of his star players walk and kind of drew a line in the sand. And this is the way that we go about things. And if you don't want to go about it this way, then you can move on. And when you've got Trevor Harris and Greg Ellingson and William Powell and all these, uh, uh, Sir Vincent Rogers, like we're talking about superstars leaving and, and guys who are integral in them getting to three gray cups and just letting them walk and not really replacing them with any, one commensurate to their talent that I, I think that kind of falls on Marcel and so yeah 14 game season but I mean he had he had two off seasons to get ready for it and try to replace some of that talent and, and didn't really do it so I think when you ask the question is it inevitable I, I think yeah and, and I, I don't know if if a 14 game season he, he really does get a pass on this one Brody I mean does this make a difference to do it now or wait till the end of the season I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it makes much of a difference, but maybe it just helps appease a fan base that's been frustrated with decisions that have been made for quite some time. And you say, look, we get it. We know we, this has to happen. We're going to move forward. And so I think from, a, from the standpoint of a really loyal fan base that wants to see success, that's used to success, I think from that standpoint, this move needed to happen. And I think too, if you want to maintain a coaching staff, if you like the coaches and you want to keep them around, you have to put some confidence in in them to say, look, we know we didn't have the pieces here. Um, and we know going forward, that's going to be an issue. So probably the right thing to do from those standpoint, from both of those standpoints, but um, yeah, it's been confusing to watch. Marcel's had so much success. And I think we've all kind of been scratching our heads going, what is going on? Well, and let me, that's kind of morphed and you, you kind of bring up an interesting point there, Brody, and I'll stick with you with this. There's a coach by the name of Paul Police. I think we all know and have at least had some shared some time within the media. I, I'll be fair. I mean, he's a real good guy. But at some point, do you wonder, is he a good head coach or is he a better coordinator? Like some guys are just meant to be better coordinators. Some guys are meant to be a better head coach. Does he fall it, in that category? I think it's a fair question, right? I know what you're asking specifically about a head coach, but I think you have to look, or for me, I look at his whole body of work as a coach and the team that he walked into. And I don't think it's fair to judge his head coaching abilities after COVID, after all of these delays, and a group of guys who the brass at Ottawa has said, look, we now recognize that 
the team wasn't good enough. And so to judge him on this season is just not fair. I think that's a conversation for later on, but he is a great coach. So let's like, let's give him a moment to just, you know, work with some great tools and get some time under his belt. I, I do think he, he's a good, great head coach, but I don't think this is a fair season to judge that on. Derek, do you agree? Oh, oh, Brody just absolutely nailed it right there. When, when you look at what you're given, you would like to bake a pie. You'd like to bake a beautiful pie that everybody could enjoy. It's Thanksgiving. We're all around the table. Uh, but if the apples are kind of mealy and the sugar is bugs in it and stuff, you're not, you're not going to get anything. This, this roster, even before the preseason retirements was a roster I thought might win three games. Sure. Before the, before the uh, season begins, they lose a couple of offensive linemen, Alex Mateus and the guy who was going to back him up. Brad Sinopoli retires. Corey Tyndall retires. Uh, those were losses. Those were losses in places they couldn't afford. But they couldn't afford those losses because they had no talent. So to then think that, like, look at what Mike Benavides has been able to do with that defense. It's actually a respectable defense that if Lapo had the ingredients to bake an offense that could get two touchdowns, they could win some football games. So I'm I'm 100% with Brody on that. I have I don't know that I believe Paul Apolise is a great head coach, but you absolutely can't judge him based on the players he was given to work with this season. Especially especially uh Dominic Davis and then I mean Matt Nichols was banged up. He did great things with Matt Nichols before, but this wasn't the Matt Nichols that he had a couple of years ago because of whatever's wrong with his arm. Uh, it looks like you're agreeing. Yeah, I just, it's, it's one of those scenarios where I feel like he was given a really, really rough slate to work with. And it's kind of, it's kind of hard to make a definitive judgment on what Lapo is as a head coach on, on this season. I look at what, you know, he had, he had some success in Winnipeg and, and I actually, you know, going back to it, I, I almost wonder if he probably deserved a little bit more leash in Winnipeg before the Bombers went in a different direction. And obviously he came back to Winnipeg and uh, that was extremely successful the way it ended, but I, I, I feel like he deserves a little bit more time and a roster that we all can look at and say this can be competitive. I think we're all uh, fairly unanimous around the table here that the roster La Police was given at Ottawa, we weren't expecting much from it. And he was kind of coming in to try to start something, but didn't have a super competitive group to work with. So I, I think he deserves more time. And I still think there's lots to suggest he can be a really head, good head coach in this league. Does, does anyone think that based on what Buck Pierce is doing this year, we need to reevaluate how good we think Lapa was as a coordinator? Um, well, it's a fair question. It's fair. Uh, but I, I take a look at how good – I take a look at how good – he has been in other spots as a coordinator before uh, when he was in Sask. Uh, I, I, I think I still, I still think that we're talking about a really good football mind, DT. Brody. I agree with Pat. I agree with Pat. I mean, I think a, a good football mind is someone who has been around the league for a ton of time. I just, I just want to give him more time. I'm not ready to make a call. <laughs> fair, fair enough. <laughs> Okay, let's let's stay out east, guys. And and I normally try not to be too opinionated and let you guys do, speak all the opinions, but I have to jump in on this one. There were some expectations building from the Toronto Argonauts, and all of a sudden they have a two-game lead over the Hamilton Tiger Cats, and they are moving and grooving. They look pretty good on all sides of the ball. They get Chris Jones in there. He's pump fisting his pump, like pumping his fist. He's going crazy. They're picking off passes and going back for touchdowns. They're talking a lot of junk. They go into Montreal and they get beat up 37-16. Again, what side, Derek, do you see this as a, as a wonderful moment, a big win for the Montreal Alouettes, or more so a tank by the Toronto Argonauts? Oh, honestly. Oh, wow. I don't want to take anything away from the Alouettes because beating the Argos is, is a real accomplishment. That's a, that's a terrible, terrible loss by the Argos. Uh, Chris Jones against a, a very inexperienced quarterback. There should have been multiple turnovers. Uh, the offense, which I, I love McLeod Bethel Thompson. I'm, I'm a McLeod Bethel Thompson guy. He threw four picks in that game. That was, that was an absolute, they blew it. They blew it. They can't run the ball. 
I don't understand why their offense underperforms passing the ball as well, even though I think they have a really nice quarterback there. Uh, that was an absolute terrible, terrible loss. Way worse a loss than it was a good win, let's say that in my mind. Pat, your thoughts? Yeah, I think Toronto missed a, a really big opportunity to get after an inexperienced quarterback starting just his second game of the year. And and I, I thought there were some really, really big chances for them to to maybe make a statement in the East Division. Because the one thing about the one thing about Toronto this year is I, I don't feel like they've done anything in spectacular fashion. They've just been the most steady team in the East division and that, you know, they haven't had these wild swings and ups and downs. And it feels like both Montreal and Hamilton are starting to get to that conversation too. But in the first half of the season, there were way more of those ups and downs, but I, I give Matt Schiltz and, and, and Montreal credit. And, and, you know, we're talking about a tough situation that, that Matt's been put in, taken over for a guy that was having another really good season in Vernon Adams and now having Trevor Harris brought into the fold. And, you know, it would be pretty natural for Matt to be looking over his shoulder at, at Trevor and when the Owls are going to bring him in. And yet here he is, two for two as a starter. You throw in that last minute drive in, in the game that he came in for VA4 yeah. and he drove him downfield for the win. Like, I, if, if you're Montreal, I'm, I'm keeping Schiltz in as long as I need to and until he proves to me that we need to rush Trevor Harris in. But, you know, I, that, that doesn't change the fact that I do think it was a big-time missed opportunity for Toronto. Brody, the William Stanback goes for two bills on that Chris Jones defense. That's a bit of a shocker. Yeah, I mean, totally. And I think these guys have hit most of most of the big points. But I think that you can look at this both ways, right? I think the surprise for Montreal, which which kind of Pat addressed, was how effectively Matt Schultz was able to get through the air. You know, he only completed 12 passes because they relied so much on the run, right? But then the Argos disappoint because they had an opportunity to take a stranglehold of the division and they just didn't really get the good effort from their offensive line you know they're missing two of their key starters there's an issue there and you know but all of that said they needed to be more prepared right they'd seen Montreal have 10 sacks against Ottawa the week before so you would think that the Argos would you know have a game plan ready you know ready to to be you know protect that front a little better but you know um it's a tough one guys and I think yeah a missed opportunity certainly Sticking in the East, Jeremiah Masoli completes 90% of his passes, throws, goes over three bills for a second straight weeks, no mistakes, two more touchdown passes. Brody, let's stay on this. We're getting this feeling in, in Hamilton that it, it's the, the, the Jeremiah watch, which is really surprising to me because there was almost so much faith in him. But I think what we saw to Dane Evans has made the fan base sort of split. Is this now time to let the boots off and say Jeremiah Masoli is the undisputed number one quarterback in Hamilton? Bubba, the last time you and I spoke, I made some strong claims about sharing space at the quarterback position, and I stand by those claims. I was frankly disappointed in the fan base in Hamilton when they booed, uh, or sorry, cheered for Dane to get back on the field um, during the game over the weekend. Jeremiah Masoli was, if I have this correctly, 25 of 28 completed 83% of his passes. You know, he looked accurate in those longer throws that he'd struggled with. He's coming back from injury. <laughs> Let's just take a moment. Dane Evans is a great compliment to Jeremiah Masoli. And I don't know why we have to say undisputed this, da, da, da. like this conversation is something we'd love to have in the CFL. And I just can, can Jeremiah Mazzoli be the starter and can Dane Evans for now compliment him with the run game? Can they work together? If there is an injury, can Dane step in and take over? I think the fan base also just needs to like chill a little and just let Jeremiah do his thing and let them share some responsibility. Poor Mazzoli's going off with a bloody nose. He can't be on. He's not even injured. He just like needs to get cleaned up and they're cheering and Dane's like, that moment to me, I'm just like, oh, that makes my, I don't like that. I don't like that stuff. Pat, two home games ago, I was at, and I could, I could hear, I could hear fans calling for David Watford, which really surprised me. Which, and that's nothing against David because he came in there as the third string quarterback and did his job. But I think it's pretty obvious, at least at the very least, who one, one A, and two and three are. 
I just, it's it, you're right. I mean, Jeremiah Mazzoli and David Watford are on on different planes. And one guy is a former East Division MOP candidate, and one guy is still finding his way in the league. And and look, I think I think that there is reason for Hamilton to be having a conversation about which guy should be the starting quarterback heading into the postseason, and I think that there is valid reason for, you know, behind closed doors, the Thai Cats to be thinking to themselves, which guy is the better one, and which guy is the better option, but right now, especially, and I, I do think you have to give a little bit of, um, you know, kind of not forget who the opposition was uh, when Jeremiah went off for his outstanding game in week 12, but I do think that that's a game that probably gives him another start. And and if you're the tie Cats, you can go back to Jeremiah because he's the guy that is more in a groove. You don't have to rush Dane right in, who's also coming off an injury and missing some time. It gives you a little bit more option to or a little bit more time to evaluate and practice and to see more of Jeremiah in game situations. And if Jeremiah in, in games coming up starts to falter a little bit, well, then you would have that option to go to Dane Evans, who was looking really good before he went down. So I, I don't know if I would say that Mazzoli is in the hot seat or, you know, it's, it's time to make that decision. But at the very least, now you have some options and they're good options to have if you're Hamilton, because if Mazzoli keeps playing better, you'd much rather have two guys you trust then have to be in a spot where you need to push Dane into the starters role once again, uh, especially knowing that he's missed a good chunk of time here in recent memory. Derek, is there a world where both guys can exist, like working together, or or does it got to be a guy? I, in my mind, it, it's got to be a guy, and I've, I, it's not exactly the myth making around Dane, Evans, but. If there's there's a thought that Dane Evans is this kind of superstar in waiting in the Canadian Football League, and it, it's never particularly shown on the field. So what you have is two quarterbacks. At the beginning of the season, I argued Masoli and Evans are essentially the same quarterback, but Masoli adds a real element in the run game, a little mobility that uh, that Dane Evans has. Neither one is overly accurate with their passes. They're both absolutely prone to turnovers at terrible times in the game. Masoli's been really nice in that respect, right? He was awful at the beginning of the year. They get lumped by the riders. He's been really nice these last few weeks. I don't know what people have seen in Dane Evans that makes you think, oh, well, he is a big step up from Jeremiah. Well, 2019, absolutely... I, I, think, I think they think 19 was the, that's why they think that. Well, see, he, he is the quarterback as they go to the Grey Cup, but he throws interceptions in virtually every game in which he plays. The Grey Cup game I was watching in Calgary going, when will Dane throw his first interception? Because with the gambling thing, there's an interception prop, and Dane was a big moneymaker for folks who took the over on, on the interception. And when was the interception in the Grey Cup? It was the first throw he made, right? And you go, oh, now we're now it's a lot of trouble. It's a lot of trouble. So there's, there's myth-making around certain CFL quarterbacks, and I, Dane Evans is good. There are teams that would like to have Dane Evans, but this isn't a situation where he is – he is so much better. He's a caged beast just waiting for Jeremiah to falter so he can be unleashed. Like, no, he's going to go in and throw interceptions when he gets in there. You have two quarterbacks that are kind of the same. So, you know what? If Masoli's playing well, he's a guy with a ton of experience. Roll with that. And if receivers get healthy, if Banks becomes a bigger part, if Addison isn't done for the year with whatever injury had happened over the weekend, you could really do some damage in those East playoffs. Bro, are you surprised that the, the Tiger Cats offense, which has been not explosive only for 2019, I think 2018 as well, too. They were, you know, among the tops in almost every single category. And it's been a struggle this season. I think a little bit. I think it seems like they have the pieces in place there. When we talk, you know, we talk about the difference between a team. I know there's no comparison, but I mean, we're talking about the, the pieces like in Ottawa versus the pieces within Hamilton. So when you don't see a team produce, maybe it's a little... Maybe it's a little surprising, but I also think that, I mean, again, last time we were on, we were having a very similar conversation about quarterback when you don't have consistency. I mean, I think when we, I mean, I can't, these guys can probably pull stats from, from their mind, but when we look at seasons past and we look at teams that had success, it's often teams that have a lot of consistency, not a ton of injury, 
And when there is huge success, when there is a lot of turnover on the team because of injury or whatever else, it's like these massive success stories, right? You're like, oh my gosh, the quarterback switched. And, you know, I'm thinking like Winnipeg a couple of years ago, like that sort of a situation, right? So I don't know. I, I know nobody likes to make excuses about that kind of thing, but I think sometimes too, sometimes too little is made of that. So if you don't get a chance to really get that chemistry and get, you know, an offense jiving together, I think that's a problem. Well, and, and Pat, like, I mean, I'm hearing all over the place. I mean, oh, people are asking me around the nation, like, did Brandon Banks age in one year? Uh, I mean, it's, I would believe the rib injury. I've never suffered one. And, you know, especially the fact that he probably goes about 155 and, and you know, and is willing to go over the middle. Uh, maybe he just needs some time. That's that's kind of where I'm at as well. And I mean, if if all of a sudden, if if Addison's injury is not major, the three games that he played, he he was starting to look like the Braylon Addison of 2019. And if all of a sudden Brandon Banks turns into close to what he was as the MOP two seasons ago or two years ago, rather, in 2019, then then I would say look out on this Hamilton offense. And, and they've been able to they've they've been able to still have some success and still be able to tread water with some of the injuries that they've had sustained and knowing that banks hasn't been the the same impact maker that we've seen in the past but all of a sudden if if this offense starts to click if jeremiah if that game against ottawa is kind of a harbinger of things to come and if banks comes out of his shell like th this this could be like jalen Acklin has had some really big big games and some big moments this this offense and and specifically what this team is capable of doing on the defensive side of the ball th this as as dt said earlier like this could absolutely be a hamilton team that is peaking at the right time and ready to make some noise in the east division playoffs yeah, and, and why not make excuses, guys? Why, why would we not make excuses for injuries knowing that the playoffs are still five weeks away, right? They didn't have Van Zyl for a long time. Banks was hurt. Addison was on six game. They never got to use Devere Posey even one time. They, Sean Thomas Erlington in and out of the lineup. The defense was hurt at the beginning of the year, right? We should right. absolutely use, I don't want to, that we should use defense. We should use injuries as excuses because what's important is what do they look like in week 16 when the Riders go to Hamilton? What do they look like in week 17 when they're in the playoffs? That's the team we need to look at. And Hamilton is a team with a ton of talent if they're all together. I, I really need to see what happens with Addison, though. That's going to be make or break in my mind. Orlando Steinauer, Dave Dickinson, they haven't had the records, I think, that would make you think coach of the year. But then you have Mike O'Shea. I mean, these guys, those guys, those two guys, have, you know, as you said, weathered through injuries and still have their team afloat and have had to work real hard at keeping their teams afloat. Then you have Mike O'Shea, who's got a 10 and one Bombers team. And I don't know if they're ever going to lose again. It's <laughs> the way they're playing right now. Derek, is Mike O'Shea the lock for CFL coach of the year? I can only think of one circumstance in which he should not win coach of the year um if if the riders finish the season 10 and 4 if the riders run the table then i would absolutely vote craig dickinson as coach of the year uh they have currently 17 guys on the six game injured list they lost four guys including big time players to achilles injuries two days before the season started to have gotten to this point if they get to a 10 win season despite all these are multiple big time and all-star players that they are dealing with without and somehow if they were to get to a 10 win season despite that and Winnipeg were to finish say 12 and 2 because after after they've clinched they don't really care that's the only circumstance I could I could say because uh O'Shea's roster the one that that he was given by Kyle Walters and I'm certainly certain he contributed to getting some of those guys back was elite super elite roster and he's done exactly what he should have done with it and maybe a little more but I think in the circumstance where the Riders win 10 games, I think as far as coaching wise and extracting from the talent that you were, that you had at your disposal, I would go Craig Dickinson, but that's, that's the narrow window in which I think O'Shea shouldn't win it. So Brody, I mean, and for all the things Derek said there and the fact that he'd been handed a great team, does that discount Mike O'Shea in winning this award? It's so funny. I was going to say the exact opposite. I was going to say there were a lot of guys that were up for negotiation in the last couple of years since, 
you know, the Grey Cup win. And I, I actually was thinking the opposite. I was thinking, wow, isn't it a testament to him that guys really want to play for him? And I think if you ask anyone in the league, he's that kind of guy. People want to play for Mike Che. They just do. And so, yes, he's been, quote, given a great team, but he's been able to retain a great team because, yes, the organization does such a great job at making those guys feel comfortable at home, like the stars they are, they're treated phenomenally, but it's also because they want to play for Mike and they want to play for that system and they like him. So I, um, I actually think it contributes to him um, and makes more of a case for him being coach of the year, in my opinion. Like, you know, for Pat, I mean, and I'm hearing, and we just in the like last week's show, we were talking about the fact that Dave Dickinson has really put together a, a nice job out in Calgary. They got on that little run. They did lose this week. Uh, would you put Dave in that category or are you still leaning towards Mike? I, I mean, I, I, I love the idea of either Dickinson brother being in the mix, but man, for me, when I, when I look at how dominant Winnipeg has been, and here's the thing, like Winnipeg's pace in terms of what they might finish with might change now because uh, they have nothing regular season wise to play for anymore. They know they're hosting the Western final. They know they're finishing first overall. So, you know, now it becomes a really interesting balancing act for Mike O'Shea in terms of what happens between now and the start of the postseason, and between now and for them, December 5th. And, so what, what's really interesting is, is how things change. But if you take a look at what this Bombers team is doing defensively, like we're talking about some historic pace they're on right now. Like they've allowed three passing touchdowns in 11 games. We're talking about a team that over an 18 game season is, is, is on, is on pace for like five touchdowns against through the air. And, and the fact that they, you know, we had last year, for instance, in 2019, Hamilton was the best team in the CFL during the regular season, but it wasn't it wasn't with such a massive gap to the rest of the field. This gap that Winnipeg has to everyone and what they've done against some of the other contenders, what they did in those games against Sask, what they've done against BC. You know, the, the, they were pushed by Calgary, but they figured it out and won by two points to start this eight-game win streak. It's just because of the gap and and because of how much better they've been it's hard for me to go anywhere outside of Mike O'Shea and let's not forget to Brody's point that you know it's not like Mike just walked in 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 2019 halfway through the season and took this team over him and Kyle Walters have been at this for a long time and they have built this thing from the ground up and you know this started all the way back when when Winnipeg signed Stanley Bryant and, and was really really active in free agency and it's built from there with Harris and and more and more acquisitions that they have had and and at the same time building some of their homegrown talent so I, I for me it's O'Shea it really is just because of how incredibly dominant they've been pretty much start to finish here. I was going to say, if you want any more on, uh, on this topic, you should go to CFL.ca and read Pat's Monday Morning Quarterback, which is all about the Bombers and about this. Yeah, it was really good. I felt like it was a great summary. I got up to date. I was like, fabulous. I know exactly where we're at. Sorry, Bubba. No, no, but Derek, here's the thing, though. And maybe, does this is, is this where the job actually begins for Mike, where the tough job begins? Because you sort of have to maintain these guys, these players, their focus. I mean, it's as you said, it's, they've clinched with a long time to go. We're five weeks to, left to go, really, before you're going to host this West West Final. So, is this where the job really begins for your head coach to balance playing time and also keep these guys sharp? Well, yeah, and this is an incredibly difficult job because the sample size which you have to draw on as a head coach is almost none, right? Oh, well, Calgary blew it. Uh, what was it? 2017. Oh, or 20. Yeah. 2017. They, they blew it. They had all that time to rest and they end up losing the gray cup. Well, it's because you have a one game shot at the gray cup, right? With your roster, you don't get to play the gray cup 10 times. And you, so it, it, it's very, very difficult. Um, it, it really is. How do you put out the playing time? The decision has been made on Andrew Harris, right? He's on the six game injured list. You don't have to worry about that, but how much do you give to Zach? How much do you give to Sean McGuire in the case where we need to be prepared if Zach gets, gets injured? Or are we just conceding that we're done if Zach gets injured? What about that offensive line? Um, I, if they lose Stanley Bryant, oh my goodness, that's going to be a real problem because they've had a little bit of struggle without Jamarcus Hardrick on the other side. Uh, 
I think they might be so deep on defense that it honestly doesn't matter if one of the guys gets hurt because they have just rolling elite talent even behind now with Winston Rose coming in to take the job of a guy who does not in any way deserve to lose his job. I, I They've been set up beautifully by Kyle Walters, and, and this is the opposite of Ottawa, right? Like, no talent, go win some games. Here's some really elite talent, go win some games. And, yeah, 10 of 11 and just the runaway Grey Cup favorite. But, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Bubba, that this is, this is where it matters. If they go 13-1 and one and don't win the Grey Cup, everybody's going to make fun of them going 13 and one, because honestly it's, it's, it's all about the championship at the end. This week we saw a real good game. I, I mean, I, I was really entertained by the Stampeders and I was really looking forward to seeing the Stampeders and Rough Riders and what this so-called battle of second place has been all about. Um, Duke Williams, I'm a big Bills fan in the national football league had some moments, this Duke Williams. Uh, what does he add Derek to the Saskatchewan offense? He adds something that was was absolutely lacking in those eight weeks where they didn't have Shaq Evans. In in 2017, Edmonton brings in Duke Williams. They put him out at that field wide receiver and they go run super long routes and we'll throw you the ball and see what happens. And it worked great. 2018 leads the league in receiving, leads the league, tied for the league lead in, in touchdown receptions, had way more deep targets than anybody in the league, had more intermediate targets than anybody in the league. This guy is an absolutely elite deep weapon. So you add that into the Riders offense, plus they got Shaq Evans back, who led the league in yards per catch in 2019. And you go, oh, okay, well, now you can operate on that final level, that, that deep level that has been completely absent from the season thus far. Cody Fajardo is the lowest rated deep passer in the league. And I spew out all these stats because I've been talking about them for every game so far this <laughs> season. But uh, Duke catches every target he had in that game against Calgary. He high pointed the onside kick that could have been a real dramatic uh, event in that game. Uh, Duke adds a weapon that was absolutely lacking and could make a real, real difference as they try to make a run through the playoffs. Pat, so I'm going to say around the loop, we're saying that the quarterback, Cody Fajaro, was, was crying a little bit after those losses to Calgary, you know, that, I, that none of our receivers are winning these 50-50 balls and the, the administration go out and get a guy that can win 50-50 balls. So I guess if you ask, you sometimes receive. Yeah, kind of. Uh, it kind of uh, reminded me of uh, Jose Bautista in 2015 with the Blue Jays and uh, saying, "Hey, go out and get." And then what are they? Well, David Price and Troy Tulowitzki and and uh, and Alex Anthopoulos went out and delivered. It's funny. I want and, and DT would know better than me, but you know, having watched that game live at McMahon Stadium, I, I was sitting there watching and I wondered. I wondered how much more going into the game uh, Cody Fajardo would kind of have a, a, a kind of a hop in his step because not only did Duke Williams make his writer's debut, but he got his guy back in Shaq. And, and, you know, I, I remember in the off season at CFL.ca, I wrote a, a column about the best quarterback receiver tandems in the league. And I went with the top five and my six was Evans and Fajardo. So they got left off. And Fajardo chirped me hard on, <laughs> on Twitter afterwards. He's like, Hey Shaq, look, where are we? And I was like, that is awesome. And I loved it. But like Shaq and Cody are, are a duo. And that is no disrespect to Kyron Moore, who has been awesome in, in kind of being that number one threat while Shaq has been down. But I mean, to get Shaq Evans back to still have Kyron Moore, who had a big game in the win over Calgary and to now get Duke into the fold, I mean, it, it, you could even tell, like, all of a sudden, they were taking deeper shots in the first quarter, and you're like, okay, I wonder if I wonder if that's even just a little bit of a mindset change. I think Duke transforms that Riders offense. He gives them another explosive option. They've got this unbelievable possession threat in Kyron Moore. They've got that that breakaway threat in Shaq, and now you add Duke to the to the fold. Like it's it's pretty scary. And William Powell has just quietly gone about his business for a second year in Saskatchewan as a reliable red zone threat and a reliable uh, a reliable running back between the twenties. I this this that was a huge win for Saskatchewan as we all know. But 
this Riders offense is something that I'm going to be really interested to watch down the stretch to see just how how much of a groove they can get into. For some of us that are that are watching on YouTube, you might have noticed, um, and those that are listening on the podcast, you probably can't see obviously because you're listening. But our young Brody here with her young child has suddenly gone through a. Uh, it seems wardrobe to be a change. wardrobe change yes. from Thai cats wear to now a Saskatchewan Rough Riders ball cap. Yes. So well, let's I guess, kill the Rider I, Nation. Yeah, you're, I guess you're pretty happy with the moves that have been made in Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to do a big shout out to the Riders because when Henry was born, they sent us the nicest gift, pa- gift bag of all this Riders swag. And I've been itching to get him in this hat. And at five months and 20 pounds, it basically fits. So here we are. Um, I loved watching Duke Williams play in Edmonton. And I was so, I, I swear to you, I picked him in fantasy every week. Like he was my law. It didn't matter what his cost was every week, Duke Williams. And I loved watching the guy play. He's also a really nice guy. So that also helps. Um, I was so excited for him when he went down to the NFL. He deserved that shot. But I was, of course, deeply um, selfishly sad that we weren't going to get to watch him play because he's just one of those guys that you want to keep an eye on. Um, I don't know how, like DT said, he is so elite. I don't think it takes him much time to get back into the speed um, and the cadence of CFL ball. But let's say it takes him one game. I think we're going to see more and more from him very quickly. And I personally am very excited. I think Ryder fans should be too. You know, you know, and that's the thing, Derek, I think there was this belief there that the things had kind of gone stale in, in Ryderville. Um, will this win, you know, kind of give them that little boost? I mean, obviously you can't clinch the West anymore, but at least solidify them as the number two team, or do you, do you still fear Calgary? Oh, I, I think they would still fear Calgary. Absolutely. They still lost two of three to Calgary, but at least, at least they never have to get asked that question again, right? Hey, Cody Fajardo, how come you at quarterback have never won a game over the Calgary Stampeders? Hey, Dave Dickens or Craig Dickinson, how come you've never beaten your brother Dave? They can never be asked those questions again. And I get that that probably doesn't pollute their lives so much, but they don't have to sit through a dumb news conference, a new Zoom with people like me going, oh, so why haven't you beaten Calgary yet? That's That's got to be a real, uh, that's got to be really nice. Uh, they're in a position right now with this offense to I'm trying to phrase this uh, appropriately to give respect to Winnipeg. If, if Zach Caleros throws four interceptions in the West final, Saskatchewan could beat them. I'm saying that I'm, it's not, I'm not really going to heard this everyone, everyone you're listening to this, this yeah. ultimate homerism that's going on at this point right now. Well, if, if Winnipeg looks so good, but I, uh, I, uh, Calgary, we were just talking with some folks about the 2017 Grey Cup, right? Calgary was an unbeatable eating machine, and there's Toronto who gets two 100-yard touchdowns and wins the Grey Cup, and you go, oh, okay, so weird things can happen in a single game. Uh, if you win 80% of the time, you're going to lose 20% of the time. Saskatchewan has an offense that makes that 20% of the time 24% of the time. Let's say that. Guys, we're I run low on time here, but I just want to throw one more at you guys, just a, a, a kind of a bonus one here. Brody, I'll start with you here. What, what's up with the BC Lions? What, 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 what's going on there? I don't know. I don't know. That's another team that you feel like has the pieces in place and you're just kind of going like, what is going on? Um, it's got to be frustrating for them. And um, I don't know. We still got a handful of games left. So maybe things improve. We've seen crazier things happen in the league. I mean, obviously they're not going to be in a position where they're climbing the rankings to any great, um, any, at any great lengths, but you hope for them and the amount of effort that their, you know, management has put into building a team that they start to see some results. But I, um, I mean, gosh, to be a part of a team that's not doing well when you have such good play, like that's gotta be frustrating. And I, I feel for those guys. And I thought it, I thought at one time Mike Michael Wright Riley was the MVP of the league. And to see what has happened over the last, I mean, Calgary's defense has been doing some really good things of late, but I mean, that was impressive to see them hold Riley to under 200 yards and pick him off a couple of times. And obviously what Winnipeg has done to everybody over the last eight weeks is, is fairly well known. So I guess I'm not surprised that they went and did what they did uh, against the, the, the lions, but 
here's the thing about BC and the thing that I wondered about when they got off to a good start from a points allowed perspective, from like a defensive points allowed perspective, they were good. They were near the top of the league, but it was one of those very clear kind of bend, but don't break situations. They were giving up a lot of yards. They were, you know, it was a situation where it felt like teams weren't finishing as opposed to it just being what the Lions have done. And it feels like maybe that dam has burst here a little bit. And look, Rick Campbell is a, a, a defensive savant and I'm quite confident that he'll be able to get this thing back on track, but it kind of felt like maybe where BC was, they were a little more inflated in the record than what they were actually showing on the field. So maybe this is a bit of a correction. I'm not worried about Riley. I think Michael Riley will be just fine. And I do think that there are some really solid playmakers defensively that can get this back on track for BC. But I, I have wondered a little bit about that over the, over the last few weeks. Derek, I mean, you saw them week one in that wild one where I think the Riders went up by like 31, and then all of a sudden it got to be a nail biter. Uh, are you a little disappointed in what you've seen out of the Lions over the long run here? I, I think it comes down to the quality of the opponent they've had to play. I honestly, when I think of it, they played the Riders real tight, and if not, you mentioned the week one game. If not for three misses by the kicker, they would have had enough points to win that game. Right. And then uh, Saskatchewan goes to BC and they play that one super tight. It comes down to a sneak on essentially the essentially the last play of the game in which the riders win that. So those there's two teams that are super even. We left there that night thinking wouldn't be great to see these two teams playing in the West semi because Calgary was out of the picture. Honestly, I, I kind of attribute this to increased quality of opponent and I, I didn't believe I'd be saying this at the beginning of the season, but Lucky Whitehead is an unbelievable player when used properly. And he tried to play through that real gross broken hand, but not having him in that offense and you have to replace a guy who was going to be at least in conversation for the team MOP with, with a lesser player. You're already dealing without Dominic Rimes, who hadn't been able to contribute much this season. I, I think this is just how seasons go your schedule gets tougher injuries hurt you in in critical spots and you start losing some games and now they're just with this this little streak they're probably on the outside looking in without really a shot at the playoffs well guys this has been outstanding again as always a great looking forward to uh, we're getting into this interesting part of the time i think really it is i mean we say it about Labor Day on a regular on a regular campaign, but now we're kind of into the meat of the season. The stretch drive is uh, underway. We look forward to, to to talking to you guys again. We appreciate everything that you help us out here with at the uh, Tiger Cats Audio Network, and of course, joining me here on the CFL this week, Brody's Pat, Derek. Thank you so much for your time. Much appreciated. Of course, to the listeners, you know where you're getting the best CFL talk because of people like this right here. And of course, the numbers are up and we really enjoy that, that you're listening on the podcast forum and of course, checking in on YouTube as well. So hit that like and subscribe. And again, join us on the Tiger Cats Audio Network. I'm your host, Bubba O'Neill, signing out. Enjoy this week's games. And we'll see you next week. The CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. Subscribe, like, and get the deepest takes on Canada's game every Monday.